the Joe Rogan experience. Let's just let everybody know what this is about. You were a game warden, or you are a game warden. Right. And what that normally entails is like, you know, you find a guy and he's got three trout when he's only supposed to right, have two. Right. It's normal stuff, like catching yeah. ch- catching people doing something they're not supposed to, just making sure people follow the rules. Right. Along the way, you guys started discovering these illegal grow ops right. where cartels were growing marijuana. Yep. And you turned from being a regular game warden to essentially, well, why don't you let us know what, how it worked out? Yeah, Joe, it was, it was a crazy journey because you don't think of game wardens doing the type of work we were doing when it comes to the, the trespass gross right. and the cartel issue, you know? And what do everybody think? They think game wardens check fishing licenses, Yeah, check your deer tag or elk tag, look for too many you know, animals, poaching, spotlighting. And honestly, when I started the job, I got hired back in 1992, that's what I dreamed of doing. You know, I grew up hunting and fishing and I got my hunter safety certificate with, with dad's help at nine years old. So I was all in the woods. You know, the woods are my church. I just loved it. It goes three generations of family. My grandfather's career Navy. My dad, you know, as an army guy. And, you know, we just had conservation in our family, you know, um, for generations. So I got the job, did it. And I did all the traditional stuff to start. Came down here to Southern California to start my career in Riverside County. So I was just over the hill, you know, from, from L.A. here. And working all the traditional stuff, fishing regulations, night hunting, you know, working deer openers. It was really cool to be a deer hunter for all those years and then actually go, you know, talk to guys on the other side and see all the good guys out there and some problems. Um, And then in uh, 1995, I got to go back home toward the Silicon Valley. That's where I'm originally from, born and raised. So live in the suburbs, kind of the foothill areas of uh, the Silicon Valley, south of San Jose there. And in 2004, I've, I've stumbled into my first, uh, you know, cartel, what we call a trespass marijuana grow site. And, you know, to specify this stuff now, now that we're regulating, you know, the last couple of years here in California, these are not sanctioned marijuana sites. This isn't the legitimate industry that's doing it by the numbers and trying to. This is always illegal. Uh, These are always here, you know, on public lands, destroying our environmental waterways and our wildlife and on private land as well. And on that situation, I had a good friend of mine, that I grew up with um, that was doing his master's thesis at San Jose State University, both of our alma mater, on steelhead trout, endangered species, red-legged, yellow-legged frog, and all the aquatics in these two creeks. And this was right below Henry Coast State Park, where I really met my first game warden that was an inspiration to get the job. So these waterways are really sensitive. Headwaters coming down through this stretch for like three miles, all these endangered species in it, black-tailed deer, you know, all these other great animals we like as conservationists. They're thriving on this creek. And he called me one day in April and said, hey, John, this is weird. One of my two creeks is bone dry. And all the fish, the steelhead fry are dead. You know, everything living on this creek is dead. There's a bunch of like debris and plastic lining and looks like camping stuff that's down at the bottom of where this creek feeds out. So I get him in the truck and I figured, I'm thinking, okay, someone's diverting water up there. It's probably a rancher needing it for cattle operation, whatever. We go to the top of the hill, Joe, then we start the hike down and I'm by myself. You know, I got my, I got my rifle, got my gear, don't have any radio coverage, don't have any cell phone coverage. And I have an unarmed civilian, my partner, biologist with me. And we're expecting to find something very predictable that I'd seen up to that point. And that would have been a normal water diversion. And when we found the water source in a beautiful canyon, I mean, crystal clear water, Trout Creek, the whole nine, start hiking down it, following this, uh, we see the dam, we see the water line, go about 100 yards down this beautiful little Grand Canyon-like creek, and there's a bunch of marijuana plants. And they're they're short because it's early in the season, they're only about two feet tall. And we see two growers. And they're not the growers I'm typically, you know, that I would have suspected. These guys are, you know, they got rifles, they got handguns, they got knives, and they're kind of cruising, working their plants, coming toward us. And that was that, oh shit moment. You know, Mm. if something crazy goes down right now and I got no backup, I got a civilian with me, these guys are armed. They're not your typical poacher that I've ever encountered. And um, we didn't get seen. We kind of hid out, you know, he's a hunter, I'm a hunter. We stayed, you know, using our stalking and stand to the creek bank and just just watch as these guys worked their plantation and went on up the hill and i looked at this and went what did we just walk into this is crazy 
um, we got out safely. And that's when I started to bring in other agencies, narcotic groups, task forces, the sheriff's office, um, met, you know, started to learn other agencies in my area. This is early on in the game. What did you guys do about that one grow up? Like when you found it, like how did, how did they resolve that? Well, we got a team together as fast as we could safely. And usually it takes a couple of weeks. And I want to say within a month we were back there. Now, the interesting part was game wardens aren't known for doing this type of work, just like you yeah. said at the start, right? So they're like, well, you guys know the area. You went in there. Help us find it. Get us into the area. But we're going to lead the raid. And we'll say, of course, this is your jurisdiction. We don't normally do this type of stuff. So uh, so go for it. So we were the bird dogs. We kind of guided them into the area. We uh, had like 20, 30 officers. We uh, kind of led them down to the canyon, got them in there safely. Um, we found the two growers. We spooked them. They didn't get caught that day. They, they ran down the canyon. Nobody pursued. Some of us wanted to, obviously, because of the environmental damages. But the biggest thing that changed the game for me that day was seeing the environmental damage. So that was a 7,000 plant garden. And at the time, we didn't know about these banned toxic substances, these insecticides, carbofuran that they're bringing up from Tijuana and, and transporting, actually smuggling from across the border to put on these plants to keep everything living off of it, not to impact their cash crop. And that was out there in some extent, but it was so early, we weren't really aware of the level of toxicity to this stuff and how damaging it is. Um, so it was all new, but we, we eradicated that, that garden. And then when we were done eradicating it, we had all this mess in the creek, right? We had camp trash, we had fertilizers, pollutants, propane tanks, um, all over in this beautiful channel that's now dry because it's been diverted. Unbeknownst to us, all that water was totally poisoned that they were diverting to water the plants. That's why that creek was so dry. Um, and we, we, uh, we eradicated everything and then it was like, okay, we're out of here. And I looked around and went, wait a minute, man. I know, we got the, I know we got the illegal marijuana out, but what are we gonna do about all this environmental damage? And nobody was reclamating the damage or, or, or cleaning up any of this mess. So I, the first thing I thought was, we have a resource issue that's crazy. I mean, I've, you know, spent my whole career up to this point protecting wildlife, preserving waterways for all of us to enjoy, you know, conservationist, enthusiast, whatever side of the fence you're on. And uh, nothing was getting done on that. So kind of the light bulb went off a little bit that we need to do more to this if we're going to get involved and we need to get involved in these type of grow operations because... It was the biggest environmental, um, you know, train wreck I'd ever seen. And I'd worked a lot of traditional game warden stuff to, to protect those resources. So once they had gotten everyone out and g g chopped all the plants up or did what they did, did yeah. they try to reclaim the, the creek? Did they try to remove the dam and get the water to run back again? At that time, no. No one really? was doing it right. And that's, that was exactly really what, what really, really kind of upset me. And again, we were new at the game. We were the game wardens. Nobody really thought of us as mainline law enforcement or, you know, narcotics task force guys or anything like that at the time. So I wasn't going to make waves. We just wanted to integrate and work together. We wanted to unify these teams. And what I really wanted to do at this point is get back with my command staff and, you know, my bosses and go, hey, we got a big, big problem out there, man. And right. There's more of this going on, and we need to be involved, even though it's not traditional, because we're sworn to protect our resources. And, well, besides everything game wardens do that you think of from the wildlife standpoint, we're mainline law enforcement just like every police officer, right? We go through the same training. And then what people don't realize is we go through two more months of additional training in a really long academy that's all wildlife-specific, wildlife forensics, wildlife ID, weapons identification, all the things you really need to do the game warden side of it with wildlife, you know, in the back country, so to speak. Um, but we needed to integrate with other agencies and kind of bring them into our world if we were going to participate. So that one case started the change in me to try to build those relationships and get into tactics and tactical circles with some of these, you know, SWAT and special operations units that would go in and do this job. Under normal circumstances, if that was just being diverted by a rancher, so if a rancher had done that and the right. creek was dry, how would you, how would you fix that? 
We would have got with him, and it, it's what's called a stream adulteration violation. Mm -hmm. And it's 1602 in our fish and game code is the section. but And it's a very common section because water is diverted for a lot of reasons. And you can divert water with a permit in certain circumstances, but you can't completely denude a creek that has wildlife thriving. That's a waterway of the state for everybody to enjoy, which this one was. And if normally the case would be that they would have to re just have the, the flow come back to exactly how it was before to exactly. remove the dam and... Yeah. Yep. yep. And that would be up to the rancher? That would be up to the rancher. It would be part of a penalty. Mm. You know, it could be a civil, it could be a criminal, it could be a probationary fix it and you're okay. It so there was depends. no real, there's no law involved or no, nothing in place rather to when you found these grow ops, like there was no previous precedent. Right. Exactly. It was, it was completely brand new. And this was, you know, one of the first grows I think that any of us have found throughout the state of California's game wardens. I mean, there are other guys finding some things and working, but being from the Silicon Valley and being inspired by those wildlands to everything I became later and what I stand for, it was home, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it hit home. But seeing that and getting to meet certain guys from the sheriff's department in my first book goes into this whole learning experience of, you know, ad hoc jumping in with other agencies and doing it. Is this the hidden war? Uh, this was the first book, War in the Woods. War in the Woods. Yeah, so you wrote War in the Woods and then Hidden War is the new one? Yeah, Hidden War is the brand new one that just okay. came out. And they're basically 10 years apart. And the cool part about that, Joe, is when you look at the differences, we do some major comparisons. And what War in the Woods covers is that chapter one is that first mission I'm telling you about mm -hmm. right now. Because that was like, bing, here it is. Right. You know, we're not in Kansas anymore. So Something's crazy. The, the people, the higher ups yeah. that were in charge of trying to eradicate the grow up and take the yeah. cartel guys down. What so their that was their job was just handling that it was just handling the the marijuana aspect of it right right and the the armed cartel guys so there was no one in place that was supposed to take care of the waterway there wasn't that and seems so crazy to me it, it does it was one of those things that it was it was based on the fact that a conservation group like from an agency like Fish and Wildlife like us we just weren't involved where we would be looking at those environmental damages right right. But from a narcotics officer standpoint, you may see the damages, but it may not register. There might not be a, you know, a mandate or even objective to clean that stuff up. And, and back at the time, DEA was funding all of our states and all of our county teams based on the number of marijuana plants we eradicated. So there wasn't any recognition of the environmental damages and any type of funding based on how much reclamation and cleanup you did. Now, that would change, fortunately. And we were, the, we were a big part of making that change, fortunately. But, and there wasn't a lot of um, funding or, or you know, point kickback or value to catching bad guys, to catching some of these guys that were doing the damages. So a lot of teams then were dropping in on helicopter lines, cutting plants, getting a big plant count, getting funded for it, taking, taking the weed out. And that was it. That's you know? so crazy. Like, yeah. I, I would imagine, I mean, uh, obviously I'm not, I don't work in law enforcement, but I, but I would imagine there would be one person who would like detail plan. Right. And I would think that, well, what happened? Well, we found out that this creek was dry. Yeah, yeah right. Okay, well, yeah. we got to re resume the creek. Yeah. Wouldn't that be like part of the plan? It would. That's, when, it, it, you would think it should be. Right. But well, so it this all, is all basically new territory. Completely new. And so we're only talking about 15 years ago as yeah. well, which is really yeah. crazy. Yeah, it was, it was the start of a big shift in my career because I saw this as a big problem. I also, um, up until in 2005, we were on, you know, one of our first, second, third, since third operation, since this one we just mentioned in 2004. And in August 5th of 2005, the game completely changed because that's when we were involved in our first gunfight. And that's when my partner, Warden, who I trained in the academy, we were partners in the squad. I had promoted to be the lieutenant for two and a half counties, the Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, Monterey, part of uh, um, San Benito, 20 days before this incident happened. And I had young wardens that wanted to p participate and do some of the stuff I was doing with the other agencies on the marijuana, you know, operational front. And this was, you know, right above the tech capital of the world, right there in Silicon mm. Valley and Los Gatos. We were in really steep, arid country, you know, August, right before the A-Zone deer opener. We were all gearing up for that. And it was three game wardens three sheriff's officers, um, good sheriff's officers that we had met on that first operation in 2004. I just uh, gave you the story on. And um, they were in harvest time. They were fortified. They had heavy weapons like SKSs, the AK-47 derivatives, sawed-off shotguns. And they had the growth set up where they were basically defending it. 
And when we came in, there was an ambush shot from one of the growers, and that was the one shot the bad guys got off. And unfortunately, that's the shot that hit my partner um, through both legs. And that bullet went through the right thigh and tumbled through his right leg, then kept going through his left. So he's down, and we're trying to keep him from bleeding out of four holes for the better part of three hours waiting for an air rescue. And we had, you know, nobody in the country from the standpoint of a law enforcement team had ever been counterattacked by these growers. We'd, you know, we'd chase them around. They'd run away. Sometimes we'd find weapons. Oftentimes we wouldn't. But so this was just a real eye opener. Like, what the fuck did we just walk into? And plus, my partner was real close to not making it. And fortunately, he did survive. Or I don't know that we'd be sitting here telling this story and talking about it. But that day, when I saw how well they were equipped, the type of weaponry they had, um, and the fact that I don't, almost didn't come home that day, I went, okay, this is super dangerous. We can't do this as standard patrol game wardens. We can't do this doing just the traditional stuff. We should stay involved in it because aside from being so violent, the environmental damages, Joe, were the worst I'd still ever seen. And they just kept getting worse and worse the more operations I'd work in my home county, right? Um, so we learned a lot from that. There were a lot of tactical lessons. There were a lot of team lessons, a lot of things we could have done different. And that kind of changed the game where we eventually got to what we're going to talk about a little bit later. 